We had a big agenda when it comes to uh, European Parliament elections, when it comes to politics and arts. But then the question comes, what does it ask from our cultural organizations? Are we able, do we have the right people? What do, what do our people need to actually fulfill an agenda that we have been discussing last evening and also during this panel here just on stage? This is something we're going to discuss here with the, this group of people, great. And I'm going to sit down, which is also nice. So, uh, we're going to discuss the needs for uh, uh, a European MBA uh, in the field of uh, culture, heritage, and citizenship. And uh, if somebody can close the door in the back, that would be nice. And then we can start. Great. So, um, I will introduce the panelists just when they start uh, speaking. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Katrin. Uh, we already saw you, uh, and you already gave a speech. Uh, you will be leaving us at the quarter two, uh, so that's why it makes sense to give you first the floor. Why is it, for you, from your perspective, so important to create a European MBA which fulfills all the questions, actually, or probably, that we've been discussing in the last two hours? We, have, we need the people who can do this. What do they need, and what's your perspective also from your organization on that? Thank you, Farid. Is the microphone is working? Yeah. Thank you, Farid. Yeah, it is working. And uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for inviting me to sit on this panel. It's a challenge, of course, after such a rich, a rich discussion that we just had, where so many points were picked up, and I don't even know uh, where I should yeah. start off. Probably I should just forget that panel before and jump into this yeah, topic of better, yeah. jump into this topic of strengthening European identity through culture and education and how to manage it. Um, I'm here, of course, not, not as an academic, so I'm not the one that is um, able to introduce this program from the um, academic point of view. Um, but I'm here as a, as, a, as a network representative that is uh, bringing together arts festivals and arts festival managers, makers of arts festivals. Um, my very personal uh, take on this, first of all, is that we have to have a very constructive mindset on Europe, I think. It is not something that we can mathematically prove um, or that we should uh, argue. It's a mindset, first of all. It's a, con it's a decision almost. It's a choice that we all take for Europe. At least I think we embrace this decision here in the room. Um, but there is not all of us uh, out there, and they were just mentioned, the, the left behind ones, the ones socially or uh, geographically on the periphery that might uh, fight or acti uh, be active for Europe. And also not in the arts and cultural world. Not all festival makers uh, that I know uh, would go on the street and fight um, their governments. Many of them are supported by their governments. Many of them are very close to their governments. Uh, not all arts is beautiful. Arts can also uh, go into another direction, as we know. So um, I wanted to introduce uh, my statement on this just by also in this framework of the arts and the politics differentiate. Um, the arts is not the good and the politics are the evil. Uh, arts makers, festival makers in our case, um, um, come together from all, as I said in my speech, from all different kinds of uh, takes on Europe and from all different kinds of views on the role of uh, the arts and artists and their role on Europe as well. So it is not a given that an arts festival manager, uh, and I will meet them as of tomorrow in Lisbon uh, for our arts festival summit, 230 festival makers will be there. I cannot take it for granted that all of them are activists for Europe. Um, many of them come to our conferences, to our training modules, to our exchange platforms to learn from each other in the first place. And many questions uh, they would like to learn from have to do actually with the daily practice, with organizational or artistic, um, uh, artistic questions. They are very, very strongly connected too. Um, how can I save money on the artists that, I can pro that I'm programming? How do I get more audiences to my festivals? And how do I get more money? These are the three main questions that every festival maker somehow is busy with. Uh, so where does Europe come in all that? And where does the, this idea or the notion of a community come on that? Where does a European community uh, very far away on a periphery, if I may use that word, uh, come, into, come into play when we discuss that question. So um, this exactly, I think, is the way 
um, uh, is a reason why I believe we have, as a network, I take that as a task for EFA, we have a we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility on the meta level of different festival makers to bring them together, not only to speak about how to improve an artistic program uh, or to to collaborate artistically, how to get more audiences, how to get more money, but to bring that discussion on uh, on the community we live into a high level um, and that has to, of course a lot to do with with citizenship with the idea about citizenship um, and with a new concept of audience development and Steve and me were sitting for a long time together with Miguel in Brussels together with a lot of other networks uh, in a platform called access to culture by the way a policy instrument created by the European Commission to create an informed dialogue process between policymakers and civil society and we were uh, trying to formulate a new understanding of citizenship and a new understanding actually of audience development. Um, and we understood in this phase, it started in 2008 already and it finished in 2014, we understood that that concept of citizenship is very remote even from, and I say even, from the arts and cultural world. Um, because of lack of um, practices, lack of knowledge, lack of information. And exactly uh, this lack, um, I, I feel, is, um, uh, needs to be filled on the practical level within the festival maker sector. Um, that is why I'm very happy when now we are initiating a new training uh, format on the digital evolution or revolution um, that festival makers are faced with, uh, that we can collaborate uh, with Steve with this idea of a new MBA on uh, citizenship and, uh, and culture and the role. Uh, also how arts organizations and festivals need to change eventually their organizational setup, yeah. need to educate their uh, team members uh, in the festivals how to deal with that topic uh, of citizenship, not merely using new technologies to get more audiences to come to the performances. It is not about that. Um, uh, audience development and communication, these two elements are actually organizational development tools, not just audience development tools. So I'm okay. very glad that uh, with this new knowledge uh, pool that is being brought together in this new initiative, we can all learn from and we can apply in the practice. Okay, let's hear from you later on. What are the means for the organization? How do you make this strategy and how do you do that? But I think we'll be on time before you leave to Lisbon. Steve, uh, because maybe you can already elaborate a bit on that. What 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 should be developed then if you if you want this notion of citizenship uh, as part of your first identity? First of all, um, if you think that education and culture could strengthen European citizenship, then the responsibility lies in the hands in the field of culture in the presenting sector. They are collecting audiences and they are presenting art. So far, this was uh, understood as daily work. We open the door, the audience comes in, they see the object, they are satisfied or angry and they leave. If this motto has any meaning for Europe, then it must have meaning for the ordinary European citizen. That could lead to a repositioning of all these directors and managers of small heritage institutions in the country or in bigger cities, all kinds of festivals, whatever festival, because now they have probably to communicate that their role in society by presenting art or objects is that of a citizenship educator. And without the citizens, you can't reach anything. So in our perspective, we need the knowledge from various disciplines from academic uh, resources, from sociology, but also from pr practitioners to offer the professionals to come to a higher level of understanding of their complex role in the actual time. 
It's a practical thing. We are not a project. We started uh, one year and a half ago. We have to finish and to present a curriculum and an organizational setup to be followed by educational institutes and artistic institutes to spread the news and to get the change, which is absolutely necessary to have an additional connection with your community. Apart from opening the door, you are servicing the needs that are identified in the communication with your direct surrounding in the citizens community you are working in. Yeah. And that means a different type of festival communication and the meaning of that communication. Yeah. Okay. Miguel, very interesting notion. Also, I had culture as citizens, education, or ed educators even. Um, can we make it concrete? What, 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 what do you think can change if we have the, the capacities, the ables, and the education to work on these themes? Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me, Steve, <laughs> to be here. We are partners, in fact, and we have been working uh, during many years together, not all of us, but uh, uh, on this concept, on the power of culture to change things and to make a better Europe, is what we always say. And I think it's important uh, not to take it for uh, granted in some way, but at the same time, to take it for granted, uh, because it's what we did. We pass into action, and we didn't think uh, or we didn't thought about, well, is culture really going to help us? Uh, is um, citizenship really going to help us to create a better Europe? No. From the very beginning, we thought that that was the only way, and we were convinced about that. And our role is convince the others that this is the way to do it. And as you say, as Steve said. Uh, we have to approach that from different um, angles, otherwise it doesn't work. And we normally have a very narrow vision on the way the problems have to be solved. What we achieve is to create a set of uh, organizations from different perspectives, from the educational point of view, from the cultural point of view, from the political point of view, and also practitioners. Because we don't understand to create culture and to use the power of culture thinking only at local or regional level. Whatever I organize something in the foundation I represent, I always put two words on it, Europe and culture. So give me the European value or give me, give me or tell me how this action is going to affect Europe or how it's going to work at European level and tell me how culture is important on this. Uh, you can always find the, the, the answer as far as you take it like an, an obligation from the beginning. We cannot talk just at a local, uh, regional, or national level anymore. And we did it at the beginning from the periphery, because we organized the first encounter in, in Juste, which is a very isolated place in Extremadura, in Spain. Even if sometimes I say that the, the real periphery uh, against the rest of Europe is Brussels because it's supposed to be the center, but it's isolated uh, if you consider it with the vision the rest of the citizens in Europe have for need. And I don't want to be against uh, Brussels or the European Union, but to have a critical uh, opinion, perspective. So that is, that is why I think it's important not to take it for granted, but at the same time, consider it from the beginning. Culture and Europe should be there everywhere uh, in everything we do. And we should okay. all ask ourselves uh, what we do in our daily di uh, lives uh, for culture. Uh, one more thing, and, and I like a lot this kind of debates, because now we are on European elections, and it's a crucial moment, and everyone is like, uh, well, this is going to be so crucial that Europe will depend on that. And here, I'm happy we are not talking about that. I'm really tired uh, to discuss again and again about if food to have sense or not. Let's talk about practice. Let's talk about projects. Here we are talking about uh, culture and politics and how we can work together. This is about practice. Let's discuss about what worries uh, to people. Don't discuss anymore about if Europe has a future or not. 
I mean, if Europe has no future, we don't have a future. I mean, that is not the discussion anymore. We have been working together 60 years. I mean, it's not enough. It's not enough. I mean, why we are still questioning ourselves if Europe should be the solution? I mean, let's see how this Europe can be the solution, but not if Europe is the solution. In okay. which way? This is our, our, our thought. Yeah. And we have to transmit this to young generation. And it's what we are going to try to do, that, to, to, to do with our project also, because uh, we need to train people, and we need also people to feel which is the impact culture and Europe has in their lives, because it has an impact. That is why we have to manage it, to have a real great and good impact. Okay, that is clear why, why for you it's important that we are working on this. For the three of us later on, I would like to discuss, eh, so what have you been finding out last uh, one, uh, one, uh, one and a half year? But let's first go to Jody Jensen or Isa, uh, Isa, Isabella. You want to go Isabella first? For, fine. Uh, why, uh, why this is such an important project and what you would like to get out of it? Well, um, uh, uh, we are the ones here representing the academic side of the project, and we are um, working on modules uh, that would uh, fill the s sort of the theoretical side of uh, citizenship uh, and um, cultural heritage and how cultural heritage management has worked out different practices and what sort of theoretical uh, uh, grounds different practices rest. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am from Hungary and one of the, one of the people have called it a periphery before uh, and um, now we are 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall and so this year we have a, a um, extra uh, poignant um, relevance to discuss uh, our Europeanness and how the chasm between West and East has been overcome or has it really been overcome and what it means to, to the central and eastern part of Europe to belong to uh, the EU and how they feel about uh, the, the recent changes. So we feel that the that the, to, to train people how to think, how it is, there are different ways to, and possibilities to think about heritage, uh, and it's not necessarily tied to a specific nation state. It's not, it, it, it's not specifically tied to a certain linguistic community, or it's not necessarily tied to a specific uh, religious community, but it can have different um, uh, constellations. And uh, when we talk about Europeanness, we you tend to talk about identity. So it, it is our task to show how that is constructed, how that's built, so, and how that there, there may be different ways of, uh, of producing that. Okay, and, and, what, and what you're hoping for is that cultural practitioners are, can have these more different view, points of view on, this, on yes, these themes. Yes, okay. they need to know this. They need to yeah. know this because that's how ordinary people also work. Yeah. Uh, and um, with this, we also want to make an intervention for um, uh, history, for academia, for sociology, to actually go into practice. Because uh, in the past few decades, really these um, humanities and social sciences have become a somewhat um, isolated. And we do want to say that there is relevance for the humanities and the social sciences. We do need them, and we, because we can provide these point of views, and we can uh, interact with um, young people and uh, um, people of the um, coming generations, and we okay. should. Okay, interesting. Well, let's find out how that actually, uh, actually works. Uh, Jody. Uh, well, you can answer that question maybe better than me. But again, I'm coming from an academic background from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and I'm the director now of two MA programs, actually, in the periphery of a periphery. So I, um, our institution is at the Hungarian-Austrian border. So in Hungary, but also at the borderland, let's say. And I want to say, first of all, that a program, an innovative program like the one that Steve Austin and the group has worked out, would never be able to be implemented in any kind of university in the center. There's no innovation 
coming from centers anymore, and centers are moving. So I want to say that we proudly um, are in engaged endeavor, um, but, but we have a very flexible and innovative structure of our own that does not in any way correspond to traditional universities, which I think are failing our young people today. And that's one of the reasons for the last 30 years we have been engaged in um, establishing and implementing innovative programs, and this is just kind of the, the next step for us. Um, I kind of sometimes like to play the devil's advocate as a social scientist and ask, ask for a better definition of terms. So I first kind of question what we mean by peripheries, and I want to state that I really believe innovation only comes from peripheries because their survival depends on it. People are too um, complacent in centers, and as I say, in this uncertain world we're living in, centers are moving. And we have to be aware of that and, and accommodate that, those kinds of um, quite dramatic changes. I, this also applies to terminology that we've taken for granted for, for decades. This citizenship. I mean, there are many levels of citizenship. Um, there is the political, and I think too often that emphasis is placed on that political nation-state-based citizenship. But there are a lot of other um, types and places where citizenship resonates that I think especially in local communities is extremely important. If we look at Germany today, people have like regional and local um, identifications that are more important to them than the national. And we have this in many places in the world and I think that has to be addressed because as we confront the increasing uncertainty of our world, and I'm telling you, the next 30 years is not going to be a picnic. Um, <laughs> we have to, I think, empower our local communities for resilience. Because when we face the environmental changes that are coming and all of the subsequent political and social um, dynamics that that is going to incur, I want to know as an educator how to prepare my students better for that kind of uncertainty. And, and, and I'm hoping this kind of a program might enable to, them to think in new ways about very complex issues. And where do you think the biggest chances are? Because you say the periphery is the biggest chance for this, because this is where the innovation is. Can you also, from a cultural perspective, uh, uh, investigate what are the chances to make this big shift? Where do we start? Um, first of all, I want to say that East and Central Europe was never a cultural periphery of Europe. I mean, never. So in that sense, um, we're still in the picture as for, far as culture is concerned. I mean, the two MA programs that we've been running now for the last 10 years are international studies and then um, cultural heritage and sustainability. Because in order to, um, to advance sustainable societies, we're not talking just about sustainable um, environment, but sustainable societies, we have to invest in culture. So part of our larger project, besides the you know, innovation in education, is reconstructing buildings in the um, medieval city, um, which you should maybe take a look at um, at some point, um, in the town where we live. It has had extreme historical um, significance for Europe because the Ottoman Empire um, stopped outside my village of Kursek. A hundred thousand Ottoman Janissaries came there and they were kept, uh, in, they didn't invade the city and there was some kind of uh, you know, compromise reached so that the city was not destroyed. It also survived the blanket bombing of Western Hungary in the Second World War. So we invest very much in the cultural monuments but it's also you know, a question of, of how the memory of the past is, um, is used. I mean, Kursek, this beautiful medieval village, was also a collecting point for Jews who were then taken you know, um, to the um, concentration camps. And that's one part of the history that the local population does not want to address or look at. So, you know, commemorating the past is much more complicated than simply promoting, you know, culture. And so I, I just wanted to um, emphasize the fact that um, investing in memorials and, and commemorating the past also um, has a lot of impact for the people in communities. Okay. 
Miguel, uh, this, this project, your corporation, is working towards an MBA in one and a half year, but you're already doing it for one and a half year. What are the first results which surprise you or outcomes which are interesting also to share with the, the audience here, like, like how it's building up to it? Well, actually, what uh, really surprised me at the beginning the most is that when we started the research uh, on what was, what was going on on, on the field, yeah. we realized that there was nothing about this. There's nothing. There was nothing okay. because there is many uh, MBAs on heritage, on a culture, but uh, always at very, very natural level. Oh, yeah. So there was not this um, link between MBA, business, yeah. culture, heritage, and Europe, yeah. and citizenship, and yeah. European identity. Mm. And uh, that was the first surprise I, I, I got when I started to look into Spain. Okay, there is many masters to study um, historical art or heritage, but there is nothing at European level. So we are creating something new okay. and something that we think uh, is going to change a little bit the thing. Uh, second thing was uh, the interest of people uh, for that, especially young people. It was full booked. We have 50 places and 200 um, applications. Yep. Wow. And we had to make a selection. Uh, because there was not enough space for everybody. And everybody was very happy at the end. Uh, we were quite, quite happy with the results. And can, uh, can, can you say something about the motives? What, what, what kind of motives did you see from people? Because I think people uh, uh, cares about Europe mm -hmm. and cares about this question of European identity. This is something that we are still creating. I mean, even for myself. But uh, when you were talking about citizenship, and uh, we talk about there is different kinds of citizenships, there is also different kinds of identity, and they are complementary. I'm Spanish, but I'm from Salamanca, so I'm from a local place. Um, I'm living in Belgium, so I feel uh, like Belgium too. I work with uh, people from different countries in Europe. Uh, I feel very European, I must say. I would, ask the, I would like to ask the audience, uh, who doesn't feel European here? I, feel, I speak uh, four to five, depending. That's okay, okay. You pass okay. the test, you pass the test. Okay, I would like to, I would like to speak more, but I, how, many, how many here doesn't feel, doesn't feel European? Mm. Oh, there's one, oh, somebody over there. Yeah, there is someone there yeah. who doesn't feel European. Okay, and can you, can you maybe come here and tell us why you don't feel European and where you come from, which is your background? What, what is not in your life which is coming from, from Europe and is, is, is coming part of your life? Because whenever I, I, I look around, uh, I see that uh, European um, uh, knowledge, um, life, or me. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about heritage, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, is this gate uh, German? Or is this also Spanish? Or French? Mm -hmm. Or is... It belongs to all of us. Yeah. And that is, that is, I mean, it's a question of mind. It's, it's a mindset uh, to be European. Okay. And this is what we try to create. And people who apply for our course believe on that. Yeah. And even there were some skeptical people that when we finished the course, understood why culture is so important and to work on culture from also from other perspectives like the business sector mm -hmm. can give different um, potentials. Okay. To European identity. Isabella, what, what, what struck you in the last one and a half year in this, in this corporation? Like first results or this, this, this European perspective which is lacking in the current um, yeah, uh, availability? Well, now I'm just, just adding to what, uh, what Miguel said that uh, there was also a poll about the future of Europe and, uh, amongst young people and how they, how they, what, what they thought uh, would um, uh, Europe's future depend on and everybody cited culture so if whatever meanings uh, culture they 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 um, of culture they they had in their heads we, we do not know but uh, um, of course we often uh, um, uh, get make the the mistake of uh, of uh, of thinking of culture and think of high culture and 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 that's that's not really what we are saying yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. what yeah. we are yeah. talking about okay. and, and what so, is good is that uh, when you hear this from people who is 20, 25. I mean, there is hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is I'm hope. Optimi I'm an optimistic there is guy, hope. so I think there is hope. hope. Yeah. I mean, uh, why we are always talking about the bad things, which are a few, when we have so many good things? I mean, and young people understand that. Yeah. 
Okay, Isabella, continue. Yeah, but the, but the, also the striking thing was to me when uh, we had this this teacher-student encounter uh, in uh, Juste that. Uh, yeah, there were uh, people in their 20s, but there were also people in their late 30s and early 40s. So, w yeah, we can call them young people as well, but uh, these are certainly people who would like to see something change, who, would, who, who crave for some ki new kind of knowledge, for, 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 an, for someone to tell them something in a different way. And they are really, really craving for this. Kind of new and, and if you give you have, if, if, as one insight what kind of strategy you developed that that this became part of their mindset or that, that, that they have the right tools now for this well we um, are you wondering about the methodology yeah yeah but yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, very concrete like how do you make sure that this is part of yeah their... we all of the sessions are very, really very interactive yeah. this this traditional format of us sitting here frontal and you listening that's not really the kind of uh, uh, way that gets them animated and that gets them motivated. So uh, we come up with all sorts of different exercises and and, uh, and um, uh, thought uh, experiments and also creative um, uh, games that they can learn through. So um, and the the whole format uh, as of as of now the these encounters uh, the, it's five intensive days so uh, and in those five days you go there in the morning you leave in the evening and you are together as a community and you learn together you you are um, doing everything together with your instructors there are uh, more more than one instructors uh, a day and uh, uh, different modules that people contribute, the instructors. So, so in this sense, one day goes really fast because you have different themes uh, in the morning. Uh, half of the morning is a different theme, half of the uh, afternoon is a different theme, and we mix and match uh, to keep them interesting. So uh, at the end of the day, they are tired, but... Uh, yeah. Their minds full of are uh, running, yeah. Well, so. talking about interaction, we have five more minutes. Is there somebody who would like to raise a question or a comment based on what he's been hearing or wants to be part of it or wants to join the coalition? Because I, I think that's also probably possible, right, in the, in the coming coming months to develop. Nobody for now? Oh, yeah, in the back, of course. Yeah, yeah. Now, what do you want to say? Well, um, my name is Tiberio. I um, think uh, one of the instruments uh, for the cultural uh, identity and, uh, in Europe is, was and is uh, um, Erasmus, but uh, at least Erasmus is uh, for uh, the privileged uh, part of our society, mainly, uh, culturally privileged, and uh, not privileged uh, part of the society uh, as the peripheries, but also in the centers, here in, in, uh, in Berlin, it could be in Köln or something like this, uh, uh, people which are from migrants and so on, they are, have not access to this uh, kind of uh, cultural programs. And I think we should open this and uh, be more, uh, find instruments to have egalitarian um, uh, instruments to give everyone the chance uh, to, to achieve a European uh, cultural uh, level and uh, open uh, the cultural uh, um, institutions, uh, not only the academic ones, but also learning uh, a normal job um, here in Europe. So finding solutions for uh, which is broadens this, uh, this instruments to all society. Okay. Is that also part of the, uh, yeah, I see two more com comments. Is that also part of what you're trying to uh, develop? Steve, very short, eh? because we have two more questions and we have four um, minutes, so. Up. You asked me to, yes, that's exactly what we are opting for. And uh, although we are only uh, one and a half year working, there are already some professional uh, leaders of tiny local heritage institutions who used our uh, papers and our experiences to 
uh, work completely new with the local community. To give you a small example of a small museum, most museums are a mixture of art museums and local heritage museums in the province. And this museum had no visitors anymore, only people over 80 years old. So the new director started to implement this kind of knowledge. And uh, she started to look around and talk to everybody on the street. And at a certain moment, two girls from the school girls came in and said, we want to make a pro we have to make a project about anorexia in our school. And you have to make an exhibition on it. Good question. The result is that uh, the museum director brought the two ladies in con contact with other amateur historical clubs, and she promised that if the school could could raise not only awareness for the problem of anorexia and related areas, but also could start a crowdfunding uh, thing, then she would bring in some uh, drawings from Vienna, from Egon Schiele, for the whole community to be exposed and talk about uh, the physics of the human being and related problems. So, okay. there nice. you are. The streets were empty at the opening night. <laughs> Probably they will not be empty for the whole year, but this is the way we think the responsibility of a small local presenter changed into a citizenship educator. Two more questions, in the back and uh, over there, yeah. Yes, I come from an academic Islamic study background, so I'm, I got struck a bit with your mention of the Ottoman Janissaries being stationed here and there and where in parts of Central and Eastern Europe. And that is, well, my question is about, um, can an education that is somehow focused on an, on an idea or ideas or a cultural set of an European education, how do you deal with exclusivist ideas of European culture? We have a uh, tradition of more than 500 years um, defining cultural European heritage as opposed to, well, some, somebody mentioned Asia, for example, you know, in the last discussion, Europe without the culture is just an appendix of Asia. That's, that's an exclusive idea of Europe. We have these notions running today mainly on um, a juxtaposition between Europe and its culture, and Islam as another part of another culture. And especially where the contact has been made, for example, in Spain, we now have our right-wing leader, Santiago Abascal, made some sort of speech at Covadonga, um, which is a focus of uh, Spanish cultural identity opposed to maybe Islam. I'm sure that you find examples in Eastern and Central Europe as well. Um, how do you deal with the fact that this kind of positivist ideas about European culture do exist and it is enough to merely react to them as they present like a political force, a political reality right now? Okay, yeah, it's very clear. I will take first the other question and then we uh, do the roundup, wrap up. Yeah, over here. Thank you, I'm Eva Kustrup, former member of the European Parliament. I was there a colleague of Simon Weil, and I helped to introduce Erasmus, but I introduced Erasmus from the little Green Party group at that time. You have always the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats as big blocks in the Parliament. So you always have to look what are the little groups, the Liberals, the Greens, and others propose, and then you should support it if you want to achieve what you said. So I proposed in 1991 that Erasmus should be enlarged for migrants, older women, long-time unemployed, and especially young people who do, as I 
weiß ich jetzt nicht, auf Englisch Handwerk. Uh, yeah, vocational education. Yes, yeah. yes, vocational education. The other thing is that there is, meanwhile, and maybe you did not hear about it in the media because it was not supported by the big party groups in the parliament, and nevertheless, a lot of good work of the parliament never enters the mass media and television. That is one of the problems of democracy in Europe. So we achieved now that there is a Freiwilligendienst, what is it? Yeah, a, a volunteer service? There is a volunteer service, and there from the beginning in the concept we said, not just for young people, for those who do not want to go to the military, but for all generations and for all social groups. So I think artists could join both, and artist groups, that means to look how they're either in school work or related to uh, vocational yeah. training, They, are, they, they make themselves experts in understanding and translation. Translation not just in the sense of languages, but in the sense what you relate to cultures and social backgrounds. And I think we should not have an academic debate again about Islam and how it belongs to European heritage. There are so many schools in Berlin and in Paris now where you have half of the class Muslims, uh, either from refugee families or a long time living in France, and you need good and intelligent and socially open artists who know something from the grassroots and not just from academics to be intermediators against violence and hate within those schools. Okay, great. Great, great point to make. Thank you. So, uh, Jody and Miguel, uh, who goes first, and then uh, um, it's, it's, it's a wrap. I'll just Jody? quickly, Carlos, I wanted to address those two kind of interrelated questions. Um, we make a specific effort to um, contact and recruit students, particularly from the Balkans and the um, post-Soviet republics. So half our student, our student body that is on campus is Muslim, and 50% um, of them have Russian as a common language. So one of the, reason, one of the ways that we overcome, uh, it's not really a cultural barrier, it's just cultural ignorance, because many times I have found that the students from the Caucasus know a lot more about European culture than students from East and Central Europe or from Western Europe, because they look at it from the outside and they want very much to belong to this, this um, you know, this region. So um, that's one of the ways that we overcome, or I wouldn't say overcome, but we, we take steps towards overcoming any kind of divisions as they work together. And so students from USTA will be coming to our university campus where they will be integrated with our students. And that I think is, you know, the person to person, non-virtual working together on, on different projects like this one is the way that we are able to, you know, increase um, our effective communication with one another. So I wanted to just okay. mention that. And Lastly, must, Miguel. Yeah, and I must add, I must, uh, add uh, that the, the students from Juste we are no Hispanics. Uh -huh. Only there was yeah. people from many Latin American countries, also from Italy, from other countries, different countries. So at the end, they were working together over there in those, in those topics. Well, what I want to say is that uh, for me, I mean, we had Erasmus, and, and that's right. I, I had the chance to know personally um, Mama uh, Erasmus, Sofia Corradi, who was the promoter of the, of the program at the very beginning. And I also had the chance to, to work and to know uh, Simone Bail. Uh, it happened that our foundation gave her, gave her an award, the Carlos Quinto European Award. And uh, well, these were two uh, special women that make a lot of for Europe. We are going to talk about women later and the role of women and the play and the, the role they play in on the on the. Um, in, inclusion and or yeah, in one of the workshops or yeah, Europe, yeah. Have to. Yeah. but uh, uh, for me all these all these problems comes from the very beginning we had to talk about children and I will give you an example as a personal example I have a daughter uh, which is now 12 years old it happens that uh, she was born in, in Belgium but um, in Belgium uh, you know the diversity we have there but it happens that we go every year to Spain to see the grandparents to have son son and um, to see the family and the friends. And there you have a lot of life outside. You go every day to the park, even during the night. And one day when my daughter was six, six years old, she came to me and told me, Papa, uh, why everybody is here mid-color? Mid-color, I am mid-color. You know, you know? Everyone was white. Everyone was the same. And for her, a six-year-old, uh, that was, The difference, I mean, for her, it was strange that everyone was the same, because for her, the normal thing is the diversity. And this is what we had to teach to people. 
And it, that is what we have to teach also to people about our culture, about our roots, about our religions uh, living uh, together or not in, in, in Europe. But you have to do that from the very beginning. Of course, some European programs like Erasmus uh, did a wonderful job. They are still doing a wonderful job. They are um, evaluating to, to, to other kind of uh, people, not only to students, and we can see the results. Uh, our project is an example of this new Erasmus. But we also have to take into account that uh, we don't have to ask the European institutions to do everything for us, because Erasmus was a, a very good program at a period where people was afraid to travel, and there was no all these ways uh, to know other people's culture. Here you have in Berlin, I have seen French, Spanish, Finnish. Uh, so now uh, the diversity and the contact between people, which is for me the most important to really get a diversity conscience, yeah. is there. Maybe we should involve other sectors like tourism, like television, like all kinds of things that are really related with people. Because now mobility is there. Social networks are there that allow us to speak different languages, to train. Even if you don't move from your country, you can learn a language yeah. very well because you have but, YouTube and but, other. But can, yeah. we, can we work with this kind of diversity yeah. and these possibilities? We, we, okay. I, think, I think we have to be aware that uh, we don't have to also always ask to Europe to mm -hmm. solve the problems because it's us who has to solve the problems. Yeah. I mean, Europe didn't, much, didn't yeah. help me uh, for my daughter. I mean, it was a natural thing because I'm, well, yesterday I was with someone who has a one-year-old and a baby, and this baby has visited already 11 countries. Hmm. So you could not imagine that. Let's profit from this movement and this transit is happening in Europe to really integrate this diversity and this okay. culture into our daily lives. And for, we, this we we need, the power. and for this, we need the right instruments and, um, and cultural managers and, and projects, and this is where the it NBA comes from. It has to be managed, for. it has to be organized. Working in progress. Uh, thanks so much, Steve. Miguel, Jordi, and Isabella. Give them a warm applause.